Okay, so this month's um, Business Insights International SME Networking Group interview is um, Jane Balaam of Reward Risk Management will be chatting with Julia Millage about the issues of employment across multiple borders with a focus on the war for talent. Um, Jane is a founder member of this network and a vital member of our steering group, regularly featuring on panels during our events. Um, Julia Millage is the head of people at Payara, I hope I pronounced that right, a global micro-national, micro-multinational software business with offices in the UK and Portugal. Um, Julia co-founded Payara with her husband Steve and has been involved in business operations and people for the last 15 years. Over this time, um, Julia has taken on many of the challenges of an owner-run business and has been instrumental in planning the growth of the business from startup through to current scale-up stages. Um, with a background in education, Julia brings the people management skills learnt in the classroom to enable her to successfully manage employee relations, performance management, L&D and strategic planning. I'll take a breath now. Um, right, so Jane and Julia, hi to both of you, and here's to a fascinating 20 minutes or so, after which I'll ask for questions from attendees who can also put questions in the chat. So guys over to you and uh, hope it goes really well thank you you need to unmute jane let's start it off on the right side here yeah. uh, thank One you very job. much thank you very much for that guy for that, that that lovely introduction for both of us um julia it was it's great to see you here today thank you very much for coming along because uh, i know um, how busy you are we sit not too thank far you. from each other and i'm very aware um, the war for talent is something that we started discussing a few weeks back here, and I, and as you know, um, something very, very difficult for a time for us all at the moment. There is a severe lack of available talent. So my first question for you today is, what is the biggest challenge you currently have with recruitment in multiple countries? And we talked about all the different countries um, that, that you've taken me through. And what are you particularly doing to overcome this issue? So, a uh, really, really big topic there, and um, I think, you know, 20 minutes is not, just on that one question would be probably be <laughs> not enough time, but obviously um, I'm only going to skim the surface of um, my knowledge and experience around this. Um, I speak from personal experience here. Uh, I'm nowhere near, you know, an expert on this area at all, um, but Payara has for a long time, uh, well, really from its inception in 2016, started by recruiting uh, the best talent globally. We That came about through a lack of a skills gap in our area within the UK. Uh, we couldn't find any talent with the right skill set, so we had to look overseas. So we have been recruiting for quite a long time. But the challenge has... Um, the, well, the biggest challenge we're facing at the moment is around global pay um, and trying to get a sense almost of what the market is doing. Um, there's two, as far as I'm aware, two different types of threads happening at the moment. There's geo-neutral pay where the business decides on one set um, amount that they're going to pay for a specific role and then they offer that to the successful candidate when they've interviewed regardless of where globally they are located uh, or the other type of uh, global pay is geo differentiated and that is where you take a role you then run a, a hiring campaign and when you actually um, have found a successful candidate you then consider their global location, their geographical location, and actually then start trying to benchmark the type of uh, salary expectation the person would have in that particular global location. Currently, um, Payara follows and always has up to this point a geo-differentiated um, salary structure, I suppose we could call it like that, um, but that is becoming increasingly tested. Um, and in fact, currently we're hiring quite a lot of, especially technical staff, uh, the technical uh, techie market. And 
there is an expectation in that market that the rates that they expect are way out of sync with any of the geo differentiated benchmarking that I and my staff have done. Um, that's very challenging for us. We have to make a, a decision. Do we pay an awful lot of money to people um, for their specific talent sets or do we restrict the business by only looking for a very small talent pool uh, where, where we can find people. So it is really challenging at the moment to try and uh, work out whether we should go geo differentiated or stay geo differentiated or whether we should go geo neutral. And that has difficulties in itself. So trying to overcome that, we're trying to follow market trends. I'm trying to look at what other businesses similar in size to us. We're only an SME. Uh, there's about 35 of us at the moment. So we are fairly small on the global scale. Our competitors in the tech industry world are very large. Oracle, IBM, Red Hat. They all mm -hmm. produce the same mm -hmm. sort of technologies that we do, application, um, enterprise application servers. We cannot compete with that market. So we are, we are up against it in that sense. So we do try and follow market trends and see what they're doing. We obviously, as I've mentioned, benchmark um, and regularly benchmark what yeah. globally we can find. One of the things I'm really working on at the moment is trying to educate our hiring managers about mm -hmm. global hiring as well and the challenges that we face as the people team to try and get them the stuff that they want. One of the biggest things bearing in mind that we're a small SME is that we have to make ourselves stand out. And to do that, we focus on not just the salary expectation, the financial hygiene factor, mm -hmm. but we yeah. actually focus trying to uh, promote that we are uh, have a great culture, we have um, a great reward and recognition program, and that it's focused on individual rather than just an off-the-shelf one. It's a company-specific, it's an individual-specific uh, rewards and recognitions program. As I say, we've tried in the past to have um, uh, off-the-peg type of, uh, like we used perk box before mm -hmm. as an example. It didn't go very well because it's not applicable to lots of people globally. Um, mm -hmm. So we've tried yeah. to make things that are specific to us. So we offer uh, something called all, by the way, all our uh, branding around Payara, as Jane will know, is a fish. Uh, <laughs> it's, a it's a long story. Uh, it comes from the fact that our uh, Payara server is based on some open source software called Glassfish. And Glassfish is uh, obviously a fish. Uh, and Payara is, if you look it up, and also uh, a, a very large fish that lives in the Amazon. Um, so all our sort of uh, rewards and recognition have a theme of fish. So we have the golden gills, we have the star of the shoal, uh, we have lots of other uh, inside the fish tank type of uh, things that we've tried to make fun and in, engaging for anybody joining the business. Talking of engagement, okay, <laughs> this is, um, something that we, we've I found particularly interesting when we first met was that you talked about the fact that even before the topic of engagement became an issue during lockdown and everybody was concerned how you engage people who are working from home and then across multiple borders and this sort of thing, you already had an engagement post in place. We and do. I was really interested to hear about that. Can you tell us a bit more about what that post is there specifically to do for you and how you cope with all the different elements of that? So, as I mentioned, we Pyara was formed in 2016 and immediately we started to hire globally. As soon as we started to do that, we recognised that there was a need to have some type of glue to stick us together, for want of a better word. Uh, and it was at that moment in 2017, around that time, that we understood that the business would need someone whose main focus and main responsibilities were about engaging and forming a bond and a relationship between culturally, linguistically and time zone, very different people. So um, we looked at hiring um, somebody with for, for a new role within the business. 
I think when you think about the need for engagement, um, I know, for example, that the current workforce and the new and upcoming workforce, they're looking for something different in the world of work to perhaps something that we look for. We pr <laughs> probably in the early days looked for <laughs> a salary and, and saw that as a, as a great benefit if we got paid. The new and upcoming workforce are looking for um, learning and development. They're looking for your company uh, position around CSR. They're looking for um, a feeling of what culture you've got within the business, what rewards and recognition schemes you do have. Uh, and predominantly, they're looking for interesting work, things that they feel passionate about and feel like they want to um, be part of in your business. And then you've also got to think about the fact that everybody feels like they need to belong. It's a mm -hmm. human trait, the need to feel like you belong. Uh, it goes back to, you know, sort of groups and tribes and families and all that, that needing, that need to feel that you're part of something. And yeah. When we put all that together, we came up with um, an internal communications and engagement coordinator is the full title <laughs> of this role. And as you can hear from the title, it splits into two parts, but they are interwoven. The internal um, communications is a fundamental part of the role of this, this person. It's about how they communicate the culture uh, and the engagement aspects. And it's about creating a thread that rolls out across the business at all times. The engagement um, side of it is, is focused into the retention activities that this person does. And that's woven right through our hiring process. We carry out ENPS surveys quarterly. Um, we have a, an average, I'm just looking over here to <laughs> check. We got a, over the last nine quarters, uh, that's since we started, we have an average score uh, of 43 with 30 being excellent. So obviously our staff are very happy and they're satisfied with the business and what it's offering them. Um, the person coordinates lots of almost daily fun activities, uh, outreach activities where Everybody, regardless of the time zone, when they log into work and when they log out, can take part in events that she runs. We communicate through Microsoft Teams um, and we communicate asynchronously through a, an internal wiki called Confluence. Um, we document an awful lot more than perhaps a traditional office where everybody was working in the same location would, and she leads that best practice around documentation and standardizing how we communicate through the written word and how that communication thread is continued globally 24-7. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think her role has been crucial to our success to date. Having said that, uh, Pyara, just like I think almost every business on the planet at this moment in time, has been hit by the great resignation. Um, and regardless of the fact that, you know, we have this role and this person is focused on retaining our current staff, the changes that COVID have brought to the way people think about work and depending on their role or their status or their section in life, think uh, the effect has been that some some of our long-standing staff, some people who've been with us five or six years, have actually chosen to leave the company. Um, and I don't think that's a reflection on her uh, not doing the role properly. I think that is the part of the bigger change that's taking part in the workforce at the moment. Yeah, there's a huge issue, both yeah. recruitment and retention-wise out there. I mean, I think, who, who did we talk about the other day? I'd lost... Um, Emphasis, emphasis has lost 80,000 staff yeah, in the last three months, which well, is a <laughs> mind blowing. <laughs> that's that's bigger than Cheeksbury. <laughs> yes. yeah, I mean, they're a global yeah. organization uh, with hundreds of thousands of staff, but yeah, that's there is that as an under, underlying current, I think, across the market at the moment, the work market at the moment. So, so have we got time for one more question, Guy? Yes, brilliant. So my <laughs> last question, um, I think, would be if you were to recommend one thing for the viewers to think about when um, they're working with other countries, what would it be? 
I think if you're looking at working with people in other countries, the most obvious thing that you would have to take notice of and actually um, intentionally think about is the fact that there are very different cultural expectations. Um, you've not only got cultural expectations about, as we've talked about, salary or remuneration, but also what we found, because we actually have employees in Portugal, we have a, a, a a business in Portugal, same business, it's just a, a Portuguese office. They have very different cultural working norms, and these are affected by their employment law um, in, in the country that they're in. So you have to have an awareness that your policies and processes are going to have to be different and change and reflect the legal status of the people in that country. That then gets affected by the political stance of that country at that time. Um, obviously, you've got to be <laughs> aware of language nuances. One of the things that became very clear to us is that um, when the majority of our staff were English, we had and used quite a lot of colloquialisms. Um, and Jane and I were talking yesterday about when you begin to explore this with people from different countries, you find that, for example, uh, we have Polish employees and a lot of their colloquialisms and sayings are based around bears for some reason. And in Portugal, it's a lot of a lot of these sayings are around donkeys. And in Brazil, because it's Portuguese, a lot of them are around monkeys and bananas. So you get a lot of these um, sayings that don't translate uh, and can cause a lot of confusion. So obviously, you have to keep language very simple. And that's why documenting things and writing things down is often a better way when you're dealing with people across borders. Um, obviously, you've got to think of time zones, you've got to be culturally sensitive. Um, and we have, for example, uh, we discourage anyone um, commenting on political or historical even uh, events yeah. that can cause quite a few problems. And obviously, your hiring process, you need to be aware of what that if you're hiring from people from different countries, you need to be aware of the um, the job boards potentially that they use and, you know, just how they see the world of work. So cultural expectations, I would say. That's a that's plenty, I think, for people to be thinking about when they <laughs> when they when they're recruiting across borders. Um, certainly not something to be uh, approached without a good deal of forethought, I, I would say. And no. uh, and, and I think, you know, for, from our discussions and from the information you've given here today, I think it's a really good head start for people to, to go back and just think about twice about, you know, what they're doing and make sure that they've got everything, everything lined up before they wade in and start recruiting across different countries. I think um, I, I was going to say, I think like most things in life, you live and you learn. And, and yeah. most of our experiences yeah. and my experiences are things that I've learned as I've gone along and <laughs> made the mistakes yeah. in the first place so thank you well thank you for sharing your experience with Always. us we really do appreciate it thank you um, and you know that was no, great. that's thank great you very much <clears throat> thanks very much julia julia i had a question before um other the guys who've lost eighty thousand employees what was the name of the company i think it was called emphasis okay yeah yeah um, they, they were in the news recently because of their <laughs> Yeah. the great resignation style thing and and is there is this because they are trying to entice everyone back to workplaces and people are booking against it um what would do we know what the fundamental reasons were behind that i no, i'm i don't yeah because I, I don't know i don't know what caused it i mean yeah. i'm for us in our business um We've lost two people due to, or three, three of the six people we've lost recently have left because they're at an age and stage in life when they feel that the nine to five work um, activity is not something they want to do, or they have other caring responsibilities that they now want to have as a portfolio of work rather than just work for one single employee um, employer. Yeah. It's okay, so in that sort of case, given given everything at Payara, um, is that a case of you guys reinventing the way that you work with people? 
so that you can be more flexible with employees or is there only so much that you want to do um, to change everything within your working practices and structures? So we're fully remote um, and have been for the majority of time. We pre-COVID, we used to have an office in the UK, um, but we always have had flexible working and hybrid working as we know it now, but informal flexible working where people could work from home if they chose to. Um, since COVID, uh, we've not been back to the office at all. In fact, during, during COVID, we downsized our office from 25 desks down to just six. I've recently returned uh, four apprentices that we have, degree apprentices, to the UK office um, and they now go in as a hybrid, so three days a week in the office and two days working from home. I don't think our structure and our business uh, organisation has been affected by COVID. It's mainly things that are external to our staff that have affected and made that choice for them. Um, mm. Family, um, burnout, um, just general issues around mental health that have been based on the country that there's in response to COVID. Um, so we, yeah. we, we've had to take those sorts of things into consideration. So I don't think it's anything directly to do with the way we organise or structure our business. It's, it's just a sign I of think the it's, the ex, it's the external forces that are going in okay. uh, and the opportunities that are now pre presenting themselves to people. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I see things come through my feed every day saying, oh, you can earn £500 a day mm -hmm. by sitting online and sending this and doing this. Yeah. And yeah, OK, um, but I'm sure it's not £500 really. That's just a carrot. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, who, who else has questions? This is fascinating. Um, I've got a question for actually Julia and Joan to an extent. Um, one of the things that is clearly starting to happen, I guess it's partly a result of great resignation, but I think it was there before, is the growing trend for digital nomads. So people, you know, one of my very close friends is, She's being a digital nomad. She started off in Madeira, yeah. to Gran Canaria, um, and she's now she's in Tenerife, and I think she's off to mainland Spain at some point. Um, she runs a LinkedIn business, but do you think that's going to change how companies will need to look at their their workforces? Because yeah, these people are not in the UK, but a lot of them are expats. But she's met Brazilians and people from all over the world, you know. So. The whole geo thing starts getting quite complicated, doesn't it? Because I'm a I'm a UK resident, but actually I happen to be living in Madeira at the moment. So do I get paid Madeira rates or do I get paid? Absolutely. This is this is my problem. Um, I, I myself am a digital nomad. Uh, I live six months of the year in Madeira. This is why I'm interested in who your friend is. Um, we go and live there. My husband and I, who own the business, uh, saw no need to stay in Britain. Um, we are a digital business we we you know have a laptop we'll travel and um we go and live in madeira for six months of the year we have an apartment there we live there full time we work there we work in a co-work space there um because we personally prefer that distinction between your home life and work life but obviously some people um prefer just to stay in their home I know in Madeira, there's a very large growing community of digital nomads because it's an ideal location for people who want to come out of the um, North Americas, Canada, and all of Northern Europe during the winter time. So we have quite a lot of uh, friends who are digital nomads who are traveling around, uh, like you say, doing Cyprus, Malta, uh, the Algarve, um, Madeira uh, over the winter period um, and it does pose a very interesting question for people who have got to work out salary expectations on that. If the person isn't going to be located in one country, how do you benchmark their salary? And this is what leads to much more of a, a, a geo-neutral pay structure. So if you don't if you pay, if you agree a salary it doesn't matter where that person then lives um and digital nomads will move around quite a lot um so it would be an absolute nightmare to track 
the salary rises and falls, ups and downs, depending, you know, if they went to live in Bali for a while or somewhere in India and then South America, it would be a nightmare to try it as a to try and track them. I'll say at this point, the people that we have working with us, if they are not located in the UK, they're not on a UK employment contract. They are freelancers and suppliers. So I organize a day rate with them. And that in, for my intents and purposes, that rate stays no matter where they move to. But they are not. It's an, it's an interesting question on, on the salaries, though, because if you're if you've got a skill set, what you're saying is the value of that skill set is less to a company depending on where you live. And actually, that doesn't make sense. Absolutely. Because yeah. <laughs> the, um, like the value is the value. Yeah. yeah. That's what it doing. also raises a different question on taxation and national insurance and all sorts of different things. Absolutely. Uh, if, yeah. if people are not employees uh, and they're freelancers, then... For a start, that reduces the cost to the business because we don't have to pay national insurance, et cetera, in the UK for that person. Uh, and the person becomes responsible for their own taxes and they have to work out where they're going to pay the taxes. Of course, you get clobbered by IR35, so yeah. I think it also ha means that as, um, as we go through, through this experience, one of the things we're going to have to move away from is this paying for long service approach that companies have where the longer you stay with us, the better your salary gets and um, through incremental pay scales and those sorts of things, because actually they're going to become irrelevant because people are not going to stay for long periods of time. And without moving around as well means that, you know, you're, you can't have you know, lots of different incremental pay scales in lots of different countries to account for the fact that people are, you know, because it won't be necessary. So I also, I, yeah. you know, it's going to be I a also really think interesting time for the for the for for our generation. I also think around. for a lot of younger people, I don't think they're going to perceive the world of work the way we perceive it no. uh, I think they're going to see more of it as a portfolio and do freelance more freelance work a yeah. couple of days for one employer or you know business another couple of days for, and they'll work in a way that suits them uh, to the yeah. to the extent that they want to at any point in time how that how think, how that yeah, goes no, I don't know I think you're dead right there because I think there's going to be less onus significantly less onus on career, 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 progression, career, career progression, progression through one particular company trying to climb the greasy pole, um, you know, and the politics involved where the onus is just going to be on, okay, I'm working two days a week for such and such a company. I've got 13 or 14 hours of deliverables that I'm going to be doing on that. Um, and then I can sit in the sun for a day, then I can do another day on another company and then I'll go scuba diving for a day Absolutely. and that would be my three that would be my three days and because of my skill set and you know you'll you'll energize your qualifications and you'll increase your qualifications for any new software or anything like that um then then you'll do that I mean one of the really interesting things is my my youngest daughter is 11 years old tomorrow she when she reaches um post-university age I reckon about 70% of the jobs that she will be doing haven't even been invented yet. You know, so, and that's the way all of the employment landscape is working. It's, it's fascinating. You know, I've got one boy just leaving university. I've, not, I've got a girl doing A-levels and I've got a girl who's just about to go into, into high school in September. And all of the different things that they're going to be doing and finding out about it's not doing what I did when I was 17. I went to work in the shipyards as an apprentice in the office, you know, and thought, oh, there might be a career job. Well, they were dying on their feet, so that didn't last long, but it's the same sort of thing. We've all been through that. Jane, you were at big accountancy practices where, you know, there were there were various, various different, I guess, career progressions that you wanted to go on as well. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating the way that everything has changed just in the last 10 years and in the way it's going to change in the coming 10 years. Did anyone have any final comments before before we move on? The only the only thing I was going to say, just going back to digital nomads, is um, 
I think there potentially could be two main groups of digital nomads. And I think they're age related because being a digital nomad is it sounds exciting but it's quite demanding and i think it's one of those things you could do possibly at different ages and stages in your life i think people who do not have any commitments or any um, requirements to be in one place for example children in school um, if you don't have that then you've got free reign um, either as a single individual or a, in, with partner or in a group to go off and do things i think the same is true of people possibly at my stage in life, whose children have all grown up and left home, yet I've still got another 15, 20 years of work left. Uh, I'm not going to spend that sitting in the same office every day. No. I'm going to go off and <clears throat> travel and, and, you know, be where I want to be because I don't have the restraint of small children around. Um, so my experience, for example, of working with other digital nomads when we were in Madeira is I sat next to a guy who was a Spaniard he had fantastic English, but he worked for a German company, so he had daily stand-up calls in German every day, and he only worked three days of the week because the other two days he went scuba diving and surfing. He was learning to surf, so he that was the arrangement he'd made with the company in Germany, uh, how he worked. They, they checked in daily, but apart from that, he worked very much in his own time scale. I think that's possibly for example your daughter's potential future there totally and then also if you factor in one of the things that i heard about on the news on the way up here today is the fact that gcses and a levels are now going to be able to take and the exams are going to be able to take an online um and that's another way that this is changing is education look 5 10 15 years down the line is it going to be domiciled in schools how much of it is going to be domiciled in schools and how much of it is going to be following the principle of something like open university, you know, where you might have a bit of core time in a school and a lot of the other time is remote learning. Is that going to encourage families to be able to be nomadic with where they live through parts of the year rather than just two weeks in Torremolinos in August? you know, or yeah. something like that. It's, uh, the way it's changing is, uh, oh, it's, it's fascinating. I think we could talk about this all day. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's brilliant. Um, great. Any, any more for any more, or shall I close this off and shall we move on to another bit? Yeah. Well